For those who don't know me, I'm Charles Goodhart, a retired professor at the Financial Markets Group here. Uh, but you are here to listen to Dr. Andreas Dombrecht. We're delighted to have him here. Uh, after a career in commercial banking, uh, becoming uh, vice chairman of the Bank of America with responsibility for most of Europe and a lot of the world beside, uh, he then went into the executive board of the Bundesbank in 2010, where he primarily had responsibility for financial stability, including financial supervision um, and risk management. Uh, in the exercise, hello, <laughs> where did that come from? What, from there. <laughs> 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 in, the, in the exercise of doing so, uh, he's the, become the Bundesbank representative uh, on institutions such as the single supervisory mechanism uh, of the ECB, the IMF, and perhaps most important, uh, on the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, where I believe, and I like to think, I don't have any access to the records, that he played a very large part in ensuring that the Basel III agreement uh, was completed and agreed and put into place uh, towards the end of last year. Anyhow, he is here to talk to us about uh, the fascinating subject of the limits of globalization. Um, now, for those Twitter users in the audience, and my preference is that there are none of you, uh, the hashtag for this evening's event, I have no idea what a hashtag is, is hash LSE Dom Brett. And I'd ask you to put your phones uh, on silent. Uh, this evening's uh, is being recorded, um, and I hope that there will be available a podcast afterwards. Um, you're all invited to a drinks reception uh, after this evening session. Unfortunately, I have to warn you that Dr. Dombret has got to rush off to another occasion, uh, obviously not as important, uh, at the German embassy immediately afterwards. So he won't be staying on with us uh, for the reception. But nevertheless, I hope that you will stay on and drink LSE dry. But in... Uh, and I'm sure that it will be such a fascinating discussion that you'll need something to calm your nerves afterwards. <laughs> but anyhow, Andreas, it's a great pleasure to have you with you, with us, and we're waiting to hear what you're going to say. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for inviting me back first time. I'm very honoured, by the way, that that Charlie Bean, Sir Charles Bean, is here. You invited me. Now it's uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's you, and I'm you know two Charles's invitations by two Charles's is as good as it gets. Um, and uh, uh, you were recently at a symposium of mine um, in Frankfurt and the gentleman who moderated the panel is, uh, he introduced first Isabel, Professor Isabel Schnabel and then he said, if you don't know Charles Goodhart, you must have been missing something for the last four decades. You must have not <laughs> been paying attention. So I, I, can, I, can, I can confirm that everybody has been paying attention. Oh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be back at the London School of Economics because it's one of the schools which I hold in, 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 uh, in highest regards and, um, uh, and uh, you know, which better school can there be um, um, learning about the world and thanks really for organizing this. I have to admit that um, on the day after the referendum I was somewhat shocked I must say, when the majority of UK voters decided and you know and uh, and and choose to leave the the European Union. Having said that, of course, I respect that decision. I clearly uh, do, uh, and I understand that many, many, many voters voiced their frustrations uh, by by voting uh, to leave. Yet, I'm also convinced that the UK and the European Union now uh, in the future at some point going separate ways will be a tremendous loss actually for both sides, both for the United Kingdom and for the European Union and, uh, and especially for Germany if I may add. And I really very much hope that 
during the coming months, we will find pragmatic ways to establish a respectful and amicable um, um, ways to establish this new respectful and amicable partnership we need and at least between Germany and the United Kingdom we always had and we really need for future for future relations. I'm just coming from a from a small speech at the at UK finance where um, I already spoke much more in depth about that and that's on our website should you be interested about this. So this was a little bit more of a policy speech then this is more a little bit of an academic speech. So um, what we need are formal relations between the European Union and um, and the United Kingdom, but we need more than formality. Formality won't do it. Uh, it will not make a strong partnership if you only rely on formality. Um, what it will take also, I believe, is a civic engagement. And that brings me to noting that universities are amongst the most important breeding grounds um, for that sort of um, uh, civil uh, engagement um, and that's especially true for such an important institution as the London School of Economics. Uh, teachers, professors and students here uh, but also from all other universities uh, um, have to be the basis for continued exchange between um, the EU and the United Kingdom and have to be uh, you know imp have to be important for mutual understanding and that's why I'm so happy that that I can be here today. And this is why I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the future of international cooperation. Um, the limits of which have become so painfully obvious, uh, not only in the Brexit vote, uh, but more generally in the, in the partial rejection of global solutions and in the rising support for sovereign national economic policies. I think that's the broader topic in I would like to frame this. So in my, my short lecture tonight, I'll ask whether over the past years, global economic integration, you can also say if you want globalization, uh, has been the stairway to heaven that it actually promised to be, um, raising overall economic welfare and I will argue that globalization's performance has actually been rather mixed. Uh, and from there, if you allow me, I will then ask what we might learn for future partnerships like the post-Brexit deal. Um, I actually intend to discuss and propose a middle way between the perceptions of globalization advocates and globalization opponents an approach of less comprehensive globalization and greater national diversity. So in order to make my case a little later, I'll apply this approach to three current policy challenges. Uh, the regulation of global trade, the regulation of global finance, and actually the future relationship between the UK and the EU after the Brexit. So I think uh, we could talk about this forever, but so I have to be precise and have to be organized because these are three big topics. Globalization is good for almost everyone. This was the mainstream judgment for a long time. I must say that I myself um, have thought that that's just what, you know, what it is. Globalization is good for almost everyone. But I must say the wind has changed <laughs> if, you, if you look at the academic, at the economic debate. More than a year after the Leave vote and after a new administration in the United States having uh, taken office, the discontent with globalization seems to be almost everywhere. You know, it is not what it used to be uh, maybe two years ago, where globalization was something which was only protested by very few. Now it is protested by, by, by large parts of, 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 the, of, the, of the civil um, um, uh, society. So do Brexit uh, and the new US trade policy threaten to reduce overall economic welfare uh, as they turn back globalization? Is that something we have to expect or has globalization gone too far? Has it created wealth only for a few while creating 
a lot of losers among the broader population? These are the questions which, uh, which I'm thinking about, I think many, many people are thinking about, and I would like to discuss uh, tonight just a little bit with you. So, well, I would say that globalization, uh, that's a typical central bank answer, by the way, that central bank, uh, that globalization is both good, good and bad. Uh, on the one hand, global economy, global economic integration has contributed to greater prosperity in many, many countries. For example, the reduction of tariffs on trade, one particular example being the general agreement on tariffs and trade, the GATT for short, has increased overall economic welfare, no doubt about it. The division of labor on a global scale has opened many channels of rising prosperity from economies of scale and comparative advantages to global technological transfers. I don't know to I don't need to go into detail. And for the last 40 years the public debate has focused on these gains. And I'm not questioning those gains. I think those gains are actually there. But then came Brexit and with Brexit also, not only in this country, also in my country, growing populist support around the world, actually. And this development is a reminder that globalization also has a darker side to it. That global economic integration over the last 40 or so years has contributed to two significant problems. First, importing and exporting lead to sectoral change and actually leads to re distribution, which produces both winners and losers in a society. Impossible to produce only winners. Now, even though globalization is less important than technological change for redistribution, we know for quite some time now that international trade creates winners and losers within a society. And there are many, many academic papers on that, and uh, I think with very good arguments. And there is I would argue considerable evidence that international trade uh, pushes some people in import competing industries out of jobs or reduces their wages. Examples of what this does to societies are to be seen, just to give you two examples, in the American Rust Belt, I think you can look to northern England, we have areas in Germany, there are areas in Belgium, you can come up with uh, certain regions in order, for, in order to list examples. And there's also evidence that it, hi that it heightens political polarization. Uh, now, a society may want to protect globalization's losers against the negative repercussions of this redistribution, or at least um, a society may want to compensate those losers for, this, for these effects. But this may be difficult um, because of the second problem of globalization I've been just talking about. Global regulatory harmonization weakens the stability of states to sustain welfare standards and regulations that are above global minimum standards. Um, the result can be what is referred to as the race to the bottom. And that is something which a central banker and a regulator and a supervisor takes very, very seriously. Now, success in slashing tariffs gave rise to the belief that ever more integration of global markets would foster prosperity growth for all participating societies. Globalization advocates identified divergent national regulations, as you will remember, as being the great remaining non-tariff barrier to trade in order to increase the reach of the global market and to further raise prosperity, they recommended harmonizing national regulation in order to reduce transaction costs. Now, this led to trade agreements that harmonized rules far beyond reducing simple trade hurdles. We have, had, we have seen quite some harmonization of rules globally. And this Harmonization pressure, if you allow me to call it like that, did not come in the shape of formal international ag agreements alone, of course, that was there too. It also came in the shape of informal pressure to adjust to global market forces, potentially leading a country to consider itself, to consider itself 
limited in its policy choices uh, because it perceived the threat of firms moving to relegations with more favorable conditions, and there was this pressure, not only formally but informally, uh, to react. Now, at the time, white raging global liberalization and harmonization were widely seen as a panacea. But the downside is that it limits countries in their individual policy choices. Just think about criticism, uh, for example, leveled against CETA. CETA is the comprehensive Canada-EU trade deal. Or think of TTIP, the corresponding US-EU project, which is, has not happened, whereas CETA actually has happened. Uh, and also, uh, Britain's desire, your desire to set your own rules, can be viewed in this light, in a way, if you think about it. Comprehensive rule-harmonizing agreements have the drawback of giving more influence to global institutions and international firms than is legitimate with respect to democratic principles. And moreover, they leave insufficient room for institutional, for legal, and for regulatory diversity between countries with different histories and with different preferences. And these examples show one thing, I think, very, very clearly. When governments and when parliaments seek to regulate markets and firms' freedoms, let's say by taxing corporations or by setting labor and environmental standards, as they always do, but resist because they feel constrained by harmonized rules and global market pressures, this can undermine social contracts and this can lead to political polarization and there are quite a number of examples for that. So in sum, despite the fact um, I saw some smiles when I said that this is a central banking answer, globalization is both good and bad. It is, um, it's not a clear-cut uh, um, answer. On the one hand, liberalizing trade and connecting the world, and I, when I say connecting the world, I mean connecting the world economy, has created substantial wealth, no doubt. We need to be careful not to throw this away, because there is a benefit from globalization. Retreating to purely nationalist solutions would almost certainly make things worse uh, for almost every one in our society, so I'm not advoc advocating to get rid of that. But yet, on the other hand, uh, globalization may have gone too far. At least it's worth a debate whether or not globalization has gone too far. The dose chosen over the past 40 years probably has been too much of a good thing, and we have to find an equilibrium where we have to sort of think through where it went a little bit too far without endangering also the positive effects which which it has brought. So what can we do about it? Uh, I think, as I suggested at the beginning, we may want a middle way between the positions of globalization advocates and opponents, um, a solution that harnesses uh, globalization's benefits and limits the neg negative repercussions. That's obviously the best outcome I can politically think of. But what road can lead us to such a so that's a goal, where we take the benefits and limit the repercussions. Now, there is the populist solution, yeah? national protectionism. Um, many people and many now very, very responsible politicians actually put that forward. Uh, and this, in some cases, even goes so far as promoting autarky. That's a new argument. Uh, I do not wish to spend much time on this, uh, as I deem this a short-sighted, incomplete proposal that claims to shield people from economic and social change without actually admitting that this is impossible even if you, if you have a, if, you may, if I may say that, if you, even if you have a walled nation, a nation with a wall around it. Um, a more realistic and quite prominent idea is to compensate those who lose out from international trade. So a compensation theory of making sure that some of those welfare gains are redistributed and com compensate the losers. Now the welfare state does, and Germany for sure is a welfare state, in considerable part already achieve 
exactly just that. That's the idea of a, of a welfare state. Uh, yet the welfare state has been somewhat in retreat as countries have at, uh, attempted to strengthen their international competitiveness by lowering social costs. So there is probably some room for improvement uh, as we have seen the lowering of social costs and also the strengthening of international competitiveness. But this will not be enough, I believe, as it does not provide a solution to the race of race to the bottom problem, which I mentioned earlier. Nor does it, e does it even out the tilted influence of global institutions and international firms. Now to understand what options we do have, I find a simple yet powerful analysis very helpful. And this is called the impossibility theorem for the global economy. And as we are here at the LSE, it must be allowed to at least put this forward, and I would, um, would very much appreciate you follow me through that argument. Now, Danny Roderick, the famous professor from this university, nobody knows here, but uh, otherwise is called Harvard, <laughs> uh, whose work in international political economy has gained a great deal of attention, I must say, um, argues that when we set the framework for global economic integration, it is actually impossible to have all three tenants of the current globalization order at the same time. We cannot have full global, mar full global market liberalization, national sovereignty, and democracy. Um, so, in other words, this globalization trilemma forces us to choose two of these three tenants. Let me repeat them full market liberalization, national sovereignty, and democracy. We have to choose two out of these three, and th which means we have to give up one. Uh, it can be only two, but it's impossible to have them all. So that's his impossibility theory. So if we look for a solution in our current globalization debate, we have actually to decide, and we have to, or have to think, <laughs> Which two central tenants we value more than the third? We have to make a choice. And I would like to go through that for the sake of the argument and because I, I find this very interesting. Now, this may sound very simplistic, but I actually think Danny Roderick has actually really a valid point. Um, just think about it. Um, if we continue to deepen global market liberalization and harmonization, if we're going to have more of that, then the ability of countries and their sovereign people to choose their own policies naturally becomes less and less. Uh, we could give up democracy, you know, which would mean that an auto, auto, autocratic ruler or a techno, technocratic government could decree that everyone has to accept full market liberalization. Or the globally harmonized rules that the government has negotiated. So we could, we could give up democracy and have them decree to follow that. Or, if we like democracy, and if we cherish democracy, some of which, uh, of whom you may, may be in this room, and we want to keep the global market, if we want to keep those two tenants, we could surrender national sovereignty to a global democracy, so that a global government and a global parliament would correct the failures of globalization. Therefore, if we continue to pursue a fully integrated global market with wildly harmonized rules, we would have to give up either our national sovereignty or our democratic ability to oppose global rules. That's a choice which doesn't sound that easy to me. However, I would argue democracy is not on the table. Uh, of these three tenants, and I think it's fair to say that Brexit and the rise of populism have taught us that our societies are not ready to renounce national sovereignty. For sure, also not in Germany. So what remains then is to limit global market liberalization, if you, if you follow Danny Roderick's thinking. But how were you to limit global market liberalization? Normally, when you try to introduce a point and you uh, 
I think it's normally rather bad marketing to start with uh, with what your product cannot do, rather than to say what you want it to do. But I'd like to say first what I think. Um, um, I would like to clarify what limiting globalization does not mean. It's always easier than to immediately jump into what it could mean. So what does limiting globalization not mean? It does not mean, I hope for agreement in this room, that we should end, let's say, foreign diplomacy, uh, that we should end multilateral international politics. That can't be uh, the goal of that. Nor should we stop fostering mutual understanding, nor should we stop fostering friendships of nations. That cannot be the limitation of global, um, of global, um, of globalization. It likewise does not exclude economic policy coordination in times of, of a crisis. Of course, we need uh, uh, e e uh, economic uh, policy coordination if there is a crisis. Uh, it was, at the end, quite successful during the last financial crisis. Why sh why, so why should we uh, willingly exclude it? And finally, it does not mean that we should resort to mercantilist policies or to rebuilding tariffs around special interest groups. I think that's not, that cannot be, that cannot be the drive of that policy. So what then? What could it mean? Uh, the answer is that we must devise a stronger set of rules that limit the negative repercussions of free markets. Now, this solution has a national and has a global component, um, where greater attention has to be placed on the national approach, actually, than was the case in the past four decades, where we placed much on the global approach. Probably we have to think also now and balance this on the national side. So I would like to emphasize three policy, policy elements. First, countries themselves have to decide what level of compensation they want to provide to those who lose out from globalization. This is not something you can decide on a global, global scale. That has to be decided in each, has to be decided in each country. Second, each society, each country, has to reconsider the cases in which certain limits to global markets would make sense. This would most likely result in more limits to international economic activity and it could lead to more institutional, um, to more legal and more regulatory diversity between countries, also having different histories, and different preferences. But there still will be substantial room for the global dimension. So the third policy element of the future globalization framework is continued harmonization, but less harmonization and maybe more focused harmonization. Um, it is my my strong belief, and it's my opinion, that we should focus our harmonization efforts on certain meaningful and legitimate minimum standards. If you want, you can think of this, or you can you can call this the globalization on a leash, not full globalization, but sort of a of a controlled globalization. So I would like to call it the globalization on a leash, um, but I would actually prefer to call it focused harmonization. That's what I mentioned before. Um, sovereign countries carefully select the suitable areas and respect where other nations see their own vital interests at risk. This means that we have to ask in what areas global liberalization and harmonization is meaningful, that's the important word, where this is meaningful and how far they should go. Um, and in many areas, the answers must, must, uh, might be that less is more. That's not only a principle in architecture, it may also be in a principle in harmonization and in economic terms. Less is more, that less liberalization and less harmonization may be better globalization. But when does a national policy legitimately protect its, nation, its national social contract? Uh, and when does it constitute the illegitimate protection of special interest groups. Where is this fine line? 
whether we can find practical answer uh, whether we can find practical answers to this question i would think is the asset test of focused globalization and only if we find an answer to that we can really enhance Politicians and their advisors need to carefully decide in which areas <coughs> harmonization is meaningful and how far and how deep it should go. And there is no simple answer to that. At least I don't have a simple answer to that. But we need a more balanced benchmark uh, than the idea of a fully liberalized global market without any legal transaction cost. That has led to where we are and that doesn't seem to be the right answer. Now, leaving room for diverse national approaches in areas involving vital elements of a country's social contract, I think could be a more realistic course. Now, I realize that uh, uh, proceeding in this way uh, takes us out of the comfort zone of our established policy principles. Um, but innovation is always outside any comfort zone, almost by definition especially since, as we all, as with all important and uh, challenging questions, we have no readily available plan with innovative ideas. So the crucial question may well be, how can we make focused harmonization work? Well, let's take the principles that I just talked about and apply them to, in, try to apply them in reality in three crucial policy areas, trade, finance, and Brexit, and go through them and see whether this leads us to somewhat convincing answers. Now, when it comes to trade, it's really important for our societies to find innovative policies that compensate for, you could even say, that prevent some of the redistribution effects of trade. There's a a lot of debate going on about how this could be best done. And it seems clear, at least to me, that we have to continue looking for a good policy mix that combines established ideas, you know, like uh, combating tax fraud, um, combating tax evasion, which are established and very good ideas, with new ideas. So we, haven't to, we don't have to throw out all these established ideas, but we have to find some new answers. And only in this way can we hope to strengthen the social contract which underpin our market-based policies. Uh, but my focus today is less on the redistributive effect and more on how much global liberalization and harmonization is meaningful in light of these challenges. In the realm of trade deals, this brings us to the question of how many trade-related regulations and laws we should harmonize and how many we should not harmonize. As the failure of the TTIP agreement shows, our approach cannot rest on the simple tenet of the more, the better. That is not going to be necessarily the solution. Instead, future trade agreements need to be focused and should actually respect national prerogatives. You can say it in another way, trade agreements need to be trade agreements uh, and nothing more uh, than is necessary to enable the global division of labor and exchange of goods. For that we do not need transnational arbitration courts as we discussed in the context of the TTIP. It was actually the biggest debate, these uh, arbitration courts in the TTIP debate. What we need is a reliable legal framework, something that all developed economies can already guarantee today. If we want to do business in a society or deliver goods or deliver services to its markets, we have to accept the rules the society deems important, the society deems essential, in which case a company's cost-benefit analysis would show either that compliance with said rules will still deliver an acceptable return or that it should not engage in that business in question. So this seems to be rather clear to me. Let's quickly, turn my second to, uh, let's quickly turn to my second example, uh, global finance and regulatory harmonization. And here, uh, focused harmonization and more diversity could also be applied, I believe. Now, this um, statement may surprise some of you, as um, Charles just mentioned the Basel Committee. Uh, and uh, the ja Basel Committee, just having finished Basel III agreement in eight long years, I, I think it's even eight, eight and a half long years, of global cooperation 
to devise the complex set of rules. And actually, I did work um, in this context. And of course, I would not wish to see this wheel turned back. It does not, it's not that we don't want global cooperation. That's what we just achieved with Basel III. Actually, Basel III is an important milestone. It's a global minimum standard, something I talked about, that imposes limits on the risks that internationally active banks can take. By defining minimum, minimum amounts of equity for banks in relation to their risk-weighted assets, it, seems, it seeks to reduce the international risks to financial stability. Now, the Basel Committee is a transnational body of uh, supervisors of 28 jurisdictions, although we are a lot more people sitting around the table. And uh, the Basel Committee has worked since the very beginning of the financial crisis to provide a global solution to problems that brought about this crisis. And don't get me wrong, I'm a strong supporter of implementing this standard in the European Union to make it a binding reality. And I am, and I know, and I'm convinced, although I cannot speak for, to them, for them, that the UK authorities will take a very, very similar view. That's not the question. However, I would like to note two qualifications. Uh, these are, as I said, minimum standards uh, for internationally active banks. These are the two qualifications. Since Basel standards are minimum standards, a country may very well decide to stack to set. Uh, stricter requirements. By the way, countries also may decide to introduce those standards earlier than others. They don't have to wait until the time frame until this has to be actually implemented. For example, as you may know, uh, Switzerland has a higher leverage ratio than in these minimum standards. And as many of you will know, the UK has ring fencing rules in place that separate vital basic functions of a bank from a riskier um, or from the riskier ones. The policy is not in the Basel Committee's making, and the UK is actually absolutely free to apply it in its jurisdiction. So clearly, these are minimum standards, and there may well be a diversity beyond and above those minimum standards. Now, the second qualification I quickly mentioned is that the uh, of the Basel III standard is that it's for internationally active banks. As such, jurisdictions are actually free to apply a different set of rules to smaller, only nationally active banks. This is only for internationally active, or it's meant for internationally active banks. Uh, now, smaller um, banks actually uh, pose no threat or a much smaller threat to international financial stability. This is why there's a differentiation in this, in this part of the three um, accord. Most nations already have less restrictive rules on smaller banks in order to reduce the operational burden on them, in order not to overburden them with administrative um, cost. I actually am a strong proponent of extending this proportionality between smaller banks and larger banks even further because the highly complex regulatory reforms we have set into place over the last years after the financial crisis were sought for these global banks, for the riskier banks, and actually overburden smaller regional banks. If you want to sum it up then, uh, we ought to focus on truly global aspects. We need to have global agreements, like regulating globally active banks, while leaving it to a nation state to carry out those tasks that they are better placed to take care of, such as the regulation of locally active banks. That is not necessarily a contradiction. And this brings us finally to Brexit. Many of us are wondering what sort of cooperation model there will be. Um, if actually no solution were to be found, the EU and the United Kingdom will trade under rules set by the World Trade Organization, which is, I guess, in nobody's interest but it's likely to be especially harmful to the UK economy. Now, politicians and negotiators are currently seeking a deal that will minimize frictions in trade and supply chains on the one hand, and on the other, such a settlement must also give the UK and the EU freedom to develop their own rules according to their own specific, historically evolved circumstances and current preferences. 
That's what we are talking about. And it may very well be that this new agreement is quite <coughs> limited, for example, to the exchange of goods. I don't know, but it could well happen. Labor migration is likely to be excluded, at least that seems like a red line for the UK government because the UK government said so. And free trade and services also seems less and less likely. Um, Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator for the European Union, said, and I may quote him, there is no place for financial services, at least this seems to be the EU negotiation stance, there is no place for financial services. There is not a single trade agreement that is open to financial services. It doesn't exist, end of quote. Therefore, it is not totally unlikely that there will be no free trade agreement for financial services or other service sectors for that matter. We actually don't know, but it's not 100% certain that we will have a free trade agreement for financial services. Our service <laughs> providers would then have to apply for full licenses in both jurisdiction, jurisdictions in the EU27 and in the United Kingdom and would have all the necessary elements of a fully functioning bank ready in both, in both economies. And while this might increase transaction costs in, in some cases, it may bring the benefit of enabling the European Union and the UK to set their own rules in an impo in important area of economic policy. And as important as efficiency, of course, is the ability to find national solutions, national rules to stabilize the social contract is more important for social cohesion than economic efficiency. You have to weight economic efficiency against the social contract. And that's what many are doing, and I understand why. And as unspeakable as this may have seemed just a year ago, it would not stop the world from turning. Um, which is why we have been urging banks and other financial services firms for quite some time now to prepare for this scenario. Uh, whatever political decision will be taken at the end, uh, supervisors, bank supervisors, will not only do all they can to make this transition to the new regime as smooth as possible, we will also in the long run try to reduce unnecessary inefficiencies, of course, where at least possible. And that that way, we can hopefully keep the efficiency losses to the economy at a rather small, negligible level. Yet one thing must be absolutely clear. Uh, relaxing regulatory standards as an instrument of economic policy it cannot be an option and is not an option. Competitive deregulation, let's say through tax or through supervisory policy, would erode the foundation of our future cooperation and we will not support that. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as Charles knows, and some of you know, I was born in the United States, I grew up in Germany, spent much of my life working around the world, uh, of course, including London. So personally, the backlash against the integration of our global community has somewhat shattered my core beliefs and worries me actually deeply, I must say. But I accept uh, that global economic integration may have gone too far. And theoretically, it may be appealing to have one global market. But the reality is that this simply may not work. Uh, it has substantial negative repercussions, repercussions that our current approach to globalization cannot handle well and haven't been handling well over the last years. We find, I think we need to find a new, we have to find a third way, and I'm not saying I know exactly which way that is, but maybe somewhat of a middle way that harnesses globalization's benefits and limits its negative repercussions, at least that seems promising to me. Uh, we need to stop a race to the bottom, um, and in order to do so, national governments and parliaments will have to be more willing to go their own way rather than believing in entirely free, frictionless global markets and fully harmonized rules on a global level. Actually, uh, those uh, national governments and national uh, parliaments will have to decide what level of compensation they want to provide to those who lose out from globalization. And this can only be done nationally, not necessarily globally. 
and each society will have to reconsider where it makes sense to impose limits on global markets and where it makes sense to impose limits on internationally active firms. However, there would still be substantial room for the harmonization of rules, but it should be less and focused harmonization, I would argue, with minimum standards only in carefully selected meaningful areas. <coughs> I personally uh, can promise you that I will do everything I can to contribute to finding a right approach, sort of a middle approach uh, between these two uh, camps. Ten years from now, I hope that we will have adapted the multilateral system to form one that does not condemn distinct national rules as something illegitimate or inefficient, but one that actually combines sensible, sensible global, global integration with institutional diversity. Only if we become that open-minded, if you accept that argument, and if you accept the rich diversity of cultures and histories, will we be able to sustain, will we be able to sustain a close multilateral system that is geopolitically stable and enjoys the support of the clear majority of the people, a support we actually need in order to function. So what I would like to put forward, Charles, tonight is to debate this earnestly uh, and intensely so that we may arrive at new thoughts and at new ideas, and that's what I think the London School of Economics is all about. On that note, I thank you very much for listening to me. Um, should there be any interventions, suggestions or questions, I would be very, more, very happy to try to answer them. Thank you. I'm glad to say we have plenty of time for questions. <coughs> uh, those who want to ask, could they please raise their hands? I see one up here and one there. And can you please give your name and where you come from uh, before asking your question? Thank you. I'm Stefan Collignon. I'm from the European Institute. And um, that's the point. Um, creating a single European market was a opening up. But at the same time, it was a deregulation and it was a re-regulation at the European level. You have said nothing, maybe because we're in the UK, about that. But I think it's an important part of um, what, what might be your middle solution, whereby you not just have national sovereignty, but you have actually European sovereignty. And I would add that, from my point of view, maybe the crucial criteria is the <coughs> extent of externalities what is a national good, what is a European and what is a global good. Yeah. Single European market is um, a big achievement, but uh, there are areas where the single European market may also have gone too far. Yeah, you have a lot of European dissatisfaction in this country, but also in Germany, about what is actually being decided on in Brussels and, you know, uh, where it's ruling into, from a German point of view, I say, most importantly, into what is the right content of a beer brewery, which is like um, too much for a German to take, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and, and other issues. So you, you, can, you, can al you always have to find this limit to what is still national and where, where, where does harmonization uh, um, in a single European market go to. So I would never debate that the free movement of capital, the free movement of labor is a big achievement, but the question would be how much should Brussels regulate and uh, uh, especially if it doesn't have a budget uh, or a very small budget. Uh, the issue uh, of externalities. Excuse me? That's the issue of externalities. That's the, that's the issue of externalities, you are totally right. And uh, on the other hand, um, look to the United States of America. You know, that's, uh, we don't have the United States of Europe but they have the United States of America, and you have huge economic differences, but you share a lot of, a lot more of institutions, and you have different externalities, and you also have more stabilization um, uh, effects than we have in times of crisis. So um, my personal view of Europe is that you have to go step by step rather than doing a big jump, and that you always have to keep national preferences and national histories in mind, and that you need to decide 
from where you want to become a European. Now, the biggest debate, of course, is banking union in my area, where we have um, given up, in Germany, for example, uh, our right to directly supervise those banks. We have been supervising. Uh, and we also have now a European resolution entity. And we have supported both harmonizations. It's not a harmonization, both uh, Europeanizations and harmonization will come eventually. Uh, we have not yet uh, the third pillar of the banking union, which is actually the deposit insurance schemes. Although there has been harmonization, right now, as you know, 100,000 euros per bank per customer are insured by national deposit insurance schemes, but those national deposit insurance schemes have not yet been harmonized and mutualized internationally. There, we say, as risks are still so different, we have to wait. We have more of a level playing field of risk before you potentially can think about that next step. So there's a limit to what you can do. So we also always have to be very careful uh, about the uh, what you will do and what you can ex accept to do and uh, where, they, where the benefits outweigh the negatives. Thank you. Uh, Graham Bishop, uh, Independent. Um, just follow up on this question of the single market, because this, I think, goes to the heart of this question of focused um, uh, harmonization. harmonization. Yeah. Um, we've chosen within a group of presently 500 million people, which is a big group, but not that big in the mixed world totality, to set a, a lot of minimum standards right the way across and the, the single market proposal, 300 directives set up um, many years ago. A lot of the antagonisms, I feel, which have now come out as populism. Um, we've got the common external tariff, ta uh, tariff barrier, as we're now finding uh, what they come to be our cost. Um, uh, but, so that is creating a European space with European rules, European minimum harmonization. The common agricultural policy is a classic when we talk about the social contract. Yes. Um, then we've got a price level which does serious harm to the rest of the world, the developed world, but it's a social contract with our people who garden our hills and, um, and, and fields and so on. Um, so we can't, we can't give that up. Um, and aren't we, we've, we've achieved, I think, quite a reasonable harmonization in a social contract. Mm -hmm. We've upset it by having the, um, the eastern countries come in, and in particular the mobility of labor. That has proven to be a problem. But that is not an economic question. Part of the reason we needed to do that was for our values, but to be more exact, the question of defense and security against what is still a hostile neighbor. So how can we build in this question of non-economic values, which need to be here somewhere? And just to finish, I don't think you need to worry too much about Brexit. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, that you know, uh, <laughs> no uh, you know, I'll start right with that. You know, it's, uh, I work under the motto, uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, I think that's the, uh, a good advice with regard to the Brexit. Uh, whether it will happen or not, I, I'm working under the assumption it will happen. And, uh, and um, you know, we as central bankers and bank supervisors are interested Interested is the wrong word. Uh, in stable financial systems and stable banking markets, and uh, clearly, if everybody who needs to apply for a license wants to go through the same narrow door at the same time in the eleventh hour, uh, there may come and there probably will come uh, capacity constraints, which will lead to um, us not being able uh, to process applications in time. Um, uh, that is normal if you apply very late uh, and and everybody at the same time, you may well end up in constraints rather than distribute this over a longer period of time. So again, so, so I'm working under the assumption the Brexit will happen, uh, and uh, uh, but that is not a wishful thinking, it's uh, a matter to be prepared uh, because the stability of the financial system and the stability of the banking market needs to be safeguarded. Uh, and also, it is, you know, at the end of the day, I don't need to tell you that the financial industry isn't there for itself. It is there to finance and advise and facilitate financial services for the real economy. Germany has a bit of a real economy, 
And for us, it's kind of important to have this competitive landscape of financial services to be legally accessible yeah, from a, for, our, for our real economy. So uh, we need that uh, uh, very much, and we want that very much, and uh, we have to make sure that we work very closely together with our colleagues here in the United Kingdom, with whom we have worked very closely in the past, and I don't see any reason why this should change. Now, with regard to the non-economic values, um, that's outside of my uh, uh, area of expertise, but it's uh, uh, very clearly, um, very clearly part of this. Uh, I think it's not only in my country, uh, but also in your country, that the uh, migration issue is a bigger issue than the economic issues for some of these populist uh, movements, and uh, that is obviously one of these non-economic values which. Uh, you know, you see some of the values reaching into that. For example, the health system, you know, which has to do with migration, but it's also an economic aspect. But that this is uh, clearly uh, one of the main reasons for uh, for uh, for um, dissatisfaction um, in my country, but also on a European level, the uh, populist vote is only explained by maybe half by 50% by um, economically disaffected uh, um, uh, voters. That explains quite a bit of it, but only half of it. So you, there must be another half, and there is another half, which is not necessarily explained by, um, by being economically disaffected. So it has to go beyond economic issues, and it actually does. And there are many, many, many studies on this. Uh, also with regard to your referendum, and so you have a very good point. That is not really something I really, I don't want to go that political. And I may not go because I only have a very limited uh, mandate. I yeah. once had a colleague on the board of the Bundesbank, Charlie, we remember, who wrote a book about migration. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was actually not in the monetary policy or bank supervisory area, and that was criticized heavily. And that is, I understand why this was criticized, because this is getting into a mandate which I don't have. Now, as I am independent, and as we are independent, one will only grant us independence as long as we stay within the realm of our mandate. Now, economic areas, that may be still uh, uh, good enough, but the non-economic values are outside of my mandate. Is that a fair statement, John? Thank you. I got confirmation. <laughs> Thank you. Usman um, Mamlenk with the LSE. Um, I, I'd like to ask you if you could give a little broader perspective, because I think your sort of argument is, well, you know, we live in a nice spot, and therefore we have good reason to sort of defend our national preferences. But most countries in the world, actually, live under circumstances which are far less favorable than mm -hmm. those that we tend to defend F in Europe. Fair point. And I think that is important to sort of emphasize when we talk about globalization, there are a lot of people who would like a lot more globalization because yeah. either they have bad governments and they don't want actually um, more national sovereignty because it has been an abuse uh, for decades. Um, and I think that is sort of missing in this argument. And, 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 and I think it should be an integral part of it. Because it's a general equilibrium that we should be looking at, and not a partial equilibrium where we may maximize you know, um, agricultural preferences in France or so, um, I think it's important to, to sort of keep oh, that I, in mind. In and you, that, you're very right. I, yeah. I come back to that. Yeah. And I'd also like you to make maybe refer to one point where we fail mm -hmm. globalization where it is easily or relatively easy to fix, which is look at global imbalances. Mm -hmm. We produce huge imbalances. Germany is obviously you know, one of the culprits of it, creating huge tensions in the international economy, um, more volatility probably than need be. So where we have a means to sort of address and make globalization work better, we actually don't do it. So it may also be a question that where there is criticism for globalization, it is because we're not using the instruments we should be using okay. to make it work better. Okay, very good questions, uh, as all the others before. Now, you are totally right that we are in a much better spot than countries w which benefit um, because they are at a different stage in terms of their development. I fully accept that. 
um, but I fail to see where there is a contradiction to, to my beliefs that if you work with minimum standards, you can always cooperate. And uh, I'm not trying to kill globalization, but I think for some countries it have it may have gone a little bit too far. So I talked about an equilibrium we need to find, and that is uh, clearly not meant to um, overburden lesser developed countries. But I, I haven't talked about it. It should have been, uh, and I did think about it, but it should have been in there, uh, so I accept, accept your comment there. But I think with minimum standards we can go very far. For example, in financial services, um, Switzerland gold plates because they think and they argue that their financial sector is just too large for their economy. So nobody has had, has had a problem with that. Uh, it is only a natural thing for them so to decide. So you can you can have other areas. Oh yeah, yeah. Second question is also very interesting with regard to these imbalances. Um, I think, if I may, um, you, one needs to differentiate between countries which create imbalances through um, their currencies, which Germany, for example, cannot do because we don't have an own currency, last time I checked, mm -hmm. uh, and others who, who do that uh, um, <coughs> on purpose. So that is a, but it's a major distinction I, I, I need to mention. Um, does that mean that uh, the imbalances of Germany wouldn't be very high? Absolutely. I fully appreciate that. Uh, but what shall we do? Now, what can one do? Uh, shall we tell German corporations to export less and to be less competitive in their exports? I don't think that's, that's something you would, uh, uh, that you would suggest. That's not really an option. Um, can, so what you basically are thinking, should we redistribute, for example, by lowering taxes and spending more, let's say, on infrastructure? That I can see. But then you have to always bear in mind your national um, preferences. Now, Germany, as a matter of argument, um, probably will tip uh, 2020 in our demographic factor. So over, you know, we're not where Japan is. But we're going that direction. Other countries don't do that. So we will be distributing. Uh, this, uh, you know, these revenues over a smaller amount of people. The trend growth in German GDP is round about one and a quarter percent, and there are estimates out there. We all know how long-term estimates go. That in the year 2030, uh, trend growth will be at 0.7 percent because of the demographic factor. So should Germany choose, and that's not my decision; it's a political decision, to say, let's bring the debt down first in order to distribute this over a smaller, uh, a, a decreasing number of, of citizens, that may be one policy which you have to contrast against these admittedly high <laughs> imbalances, but which don't stem from us manipulating in any way our currency, which have to do with the competitiveness of the, of, of the, of the German economy or parts of the German economy. So that's not that easy. I see your point, and it's a, and I think that public expenditure may, that we may be a little bit or quite a bit under invested in public expenditure, um, and we are having a coalition talks right now, and uh, we have to see whether this argument of yours is actually being now um, taken up. But nevertheless, please accept that you also have a responsibility to look ahead and see that the, that the population in Germany is going down and will be going down and that you need to, to, to also uh, uh, take care of that if you want to do, um, if you wanna do uh, responsible policies. My last argument, if I may say, um, is that let's don't forget that the Maastricht criteria, which, by the way, still apply, talk about a 60% debt to GDP. Uh, we are not at 60%. I don't know where we are, or my colleagues from the embassy have to tell me. I think we're below 70, but maybe at 68, don't, uh, uh, who knows uh, in this room, but 
below 70, but quite away from 60, but not, it's in, within sight. Uh, if Germany, as the strongest economy in the European Union, disregards the Maastricht criteria, that is also a signal in itself. I wonder, you know, so there are always, you have to sort of balance uh, certain ideas, and maybe it may, may make, it's not my decision, it may make sense to want to reach the last criteria of, of, of this before you, before you think about other policies which are my, not my decision. So I'm trying not to suggest something, but I'm trying to put other elements into the equation, which are, coming back to my little intervention from earlier, national preferences. So you have to weigh certain things against each other. That is not the central bank. That's the, that's the political leadership of the country. But there are other aspects, too, which, uh, which, which apply. And it's also a timing issue. It's not a yes or no. You don't have to make a decision forever, but you have to sort of stagger things going forward. Sorry for this long answer to your very good question. Okay. Brendan. Uh, thank you. Uh, this somewhat uh, speaks, I think, to the last uh, Who question. are you? Oh, sorry. My name is Brandon Davies, and I, uh, I have had lots of roles in, in finance, but at the moment I'm on the board of a number of finance companies. Um, but uh, this speaks to something that happened in Indonesia a few years ago quite a few years ago. And I was there um, running a project to uh, help the Indonesian Central Bank mm -hmm. um, implement Bowl 2. And uh, I got an invitation from the Deputy Governor to come and debate something with him. And it spoke to me very much of what you've been saying. Because his question was, why should a country that is poor, that is very young, and that is very, has, and is very fast growing, it's only about 7% of the time, have its risk preference dictated by countries that are old, rich, and um, and have very little capability for growth. I would be interested in what you answered. Uh, <laughs> my answer was it shouldn't be. Oh. <laughs> uh, and my answer was I think you need a much bigger role in uh, what we are going to see. In my view was what yeah. you're going to see is a reform of things like that because the seven that was running it then and now 28, you say, but will eventually have to take into account many countries, I think Indonesia's 250 million people, many countries which are very different and have a very different hmm. uh, view of what global regulation might look like. Yeah. And it strikes me that what you've been saying might actually speak very much of that. Yeah. Now, respect. Indonesia is one of the 28 countries in the Basel yeah. Committee, so that's, a, so that's a only a fair point that they yeah. ask you otherwise. <laughs> now, by the way, as I said earlier, there are 28 jurisdictions in the Basel Committee, but the but Basel II, for example, has is applied in more than 100 countries. So it is far beyond this membership of, of, of the Basel Committee, and that is interesting because um, you don't want to create, you know, uh, an agenda only for 28 countries, but you want to build a global standard, which is exactly what I talked about. And you will remember that I said that I think that a global standard and a global equal implementation of Basel III is very important. Now, the banking system or the financial services sector is especially global and especially interconnected. Uh, there are other services which may, uh, or goods which are not as interconnected as the financial services sector, as we all know now. And uh, that's why um, if you want to be part of this international financial industry, um, you probably will have to put some, some standards in place. If I may, I, will, I may remind you that the Basel Committee works on, help me with the English, anonymity. Everybody has to agree. So uh, should Indonesia, or for that matter, any other country be of a different opinion, you'll never get to an agreement. But there is, you have to wait the benefit of an agreement against the cost of uh, uh, opposing it. And uh, so and that is what Indonesia probably did. Uh, we had the same problem in this round of negotiations when we had to wait. Do we try to have a 72.5% output for? You know, I know a very important, prominent professor who argues we should have higher output for us, 
uh, for the sake of financial stability, but you try to find a compromise where everybody around the table can agree in order to formulate a policy with a minimum standard that you can gold plate. Now, we are seeing now with regard to Basel III that, for example, Canada has announced that they want to introduce earlier. And we have other countries who say we're going to have higher output for us, for, like, for example, the United States of America. And, uh, and that's just fine. So, so it's really the question of what, what works for the global standards. Um, and I remind you, I, I remember one thing. I don't know whether Charlie, was, uh, Charlie Bean was in the meeting too. That was the first FSB meeting when we decided... Uh, a, a, the journalist should not write that, please, if that's possible. Uh, uh, but it's it's a true story uh, where we decided which would be the global systemically important banks and which would not be. And there was a there was a criteria, and a certain amount of banks were above that. And there was a gray zone where you could opt into this. And for example, the Chinese bank at the time that's long ago, eight years ago, the Chinese bank was not was in this gray zone. And the Chinese colleague said. We rather be in the global city. We don't qualify yet. We want to learn. We want to understand what the issues are. Over time, we may well be in that criteria. So we rather want to have a view of what is, uh, and we fulfill the capital criteria. So why not? Why not do this? I can only mention this because this is a long time ago, and uh, and that is that's one way of this international cooperation, which is your choice. You don't need to, you can do, and uh, some may opt out and some may opt in, and for different reasons, for very different reasons, and, and, and as we said in the, in the imbalances context, some may have very different uh, backgrounds than others. So we have to have some national basis on which you found that, because it, not every country is, we cannot harmonize globally in a way that, that national contexts, and we still have national fiscal policy, for example, in our single market, uh, um, and no European finance minister. <laughs> so uh, so we, 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 we still have to make sure that we get this equilibrium right. I'd like to try and get in two questions, and so both the questions and the answers could be relatively brief, because yes. Dr. Dombrett really wants to get away as soon as possible after 6.15. So first question and the last question, as always, the lady has the last word. <laughs> What's new? Um, well, my name is Michael Iverson from The Banker magazine. Uh, I'm one of the editors there. And what you were saying about sovereignty is very interesting. It sounds as if by putting sovereignty is the one thing you can't give, one, one, one of the things you can't give up. That sounds like a good defense of Brexit. I voted Brexit, by the way, probably one of the maybe the only person in this room, um, and uh, I believe you're wrong there, Mr. Bishop, uh, it will happen. Uh, I've got to keep this very brief. Um, does, it, does the fact that you support uh, sovereignty um, mean that you would actually not want to see the United States of Europe, and you would not want to see, for example, fiscal union? Because that would make yeah, you... I can give you a very... Uh, uh, again, this is outside of my mandate, but uh, I don't think that you can form a United States of Europe in national parliaments, you probably will have to go to the people. And I don't see, I, I, I make it my living by traveling to the capitals of Europe, and I don't think any support for that right now. So as what, what I want doesn't matter. It's not my mandate, but it's not realistic to think that this is something which is, which is, which is, which is realistic right now. So what you have to do is you have step by step rather than right. jump to that uh, uh, to that solution. And the last question is to the lady at the back. No, no, not you. You haven't put your hand up. Uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't. I didn't see it. You didn't do it well enough. <laughs> uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Bijan. I work for Allianz Group uh, in London. Um, I have a short question. Um, so what would be the indicators that you measure the progress of um, focused harmonization? Would that be you want to see the corporate profits to GDP come down, or that's the income distribution? So what would they measure? And it, it, if I yeah. know, can mm -hmm. I ask another question? Yeah. Um, it's what role does technology play in your framework? Because if we look at the business, business model today, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and uh, virtual currency, they all 
decentralizing technologies. They're, they're all global. So how, how should the framework look like with consideration of those technology disruption? Yeah. No, the measures, uh, another two good questions. Measures would take too long because I need to go to the embassy, but I don't want to get a global GDP down. It's, a, it's more of a factor of if you have a situation where the overall wealth increases, but only for a certain part of society, you need to think through what you do with that additional value created in terms of redistribution, that doesn't mean that you bring the global GDP down. That's not the idea. I said, if you remember, I said, let's don't throw away this benefit. Now, the technology question, uh, if you look to the populist phenomena, which we are having, um, there are two main feedbacks we are getting. Um, there are fears of globalization, which we discussed a little bit, and there is fear of technologi technological advances, which is not the same thing. Now, many, many people fear robots, have never having seen a single robot in their life. Uh, there is now, for example, a fear in the United States of America, I understand, that if you have cars which are self-directed, how you call that, uh, that uh, there are 7 million jobs, apparently, I'm not sure, uh, of of truck drivers and other drivers, where, which could theoretically at some point be replaced through self-directed cars. So technology is a very important, very important issue for many reasons, in terms of tax base, in terms of um, fears, in terms of uh, innovation, in terms of efficiency, in, in, in many, 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 many respects. Uh, it also throws a a big question mark on how we measure growth and uh, what that means uh, for the future. Um, we need technological innovation, but we need to make sure that the benefits of that technological innovation does not only reach very few, so that we distribute this also uh, as much as we can and that we have accessibility. What can we do? Just to give you one very few examples, uh, for example, you can use those profits from, let's say, globalization of technology to retrain people who lose their jobs in order to get their skill level up. Just to give you one example, as we are at a university, to make sure that those losers have a chance of stay integrated in the job market. They hardly pay any tax. That's, uh, that is what I mentioned earlier, that is, and that is a very, very wrong problem. Uh, that's very, very wrong. Uh, so, so we have to use some of these established methods, as I said before, and, and some new ideas to go after that. But the technology issue, I don't take lightly. I think it's a very big issue. Andreas, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.